Today we're going to be talking about a book that I read recently for a book club, but I read for the first time a couple of years ago, and that is To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. Before we get into that though, a little bit of a story for you. So the first time I was ever introduced to Virginia Woolf was when I was an undergrad doing philosophy and English, and we read Mrs. Dalloway, and I could not stand the book at all. I thought it was boring, I thought it was confusing, and I just hated it mainly because it was the first time I ever read an experimental text, and so I just wasn't ready for it, and I was at uni, and you know, when you're at uni as an undergrad, work is the last thing that you want to do. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if Virginia Woolf and Mrs. Dalloway was one of the reasons why I dropped English and then just switched to a pure philosophy major. And I didn't expect my views on Woolf to change, and I didn't read anything by her for the next five years, until I decided to give her another go, and I read To the Lighthouse. And I was shocked by the fact that after reading this book, I really enjoyed it. I don't know what it was about reading this all those years later, but something clicked and this time I found the writing style really engaging and I just thought it was fantastic. So the moral of this little story then is, just because you don't like something when you're in school or when you're at university, it doesn't mean your opinions are always going to change, and that's something that I found to be true with Virginia Woolf. Anyway, with that little story out of the way, let's get on to the discussion. Part 1. Summary. To the Lighthouse tells the family saga of the Ramsey family. It focuses on two visits that the family makes, the first in 1910 and then in 1920, to the Isle of Skye in Scotland. The story has no central characters, the narrative instead shifts between different perspectives and is told through the thoughts of the members of the Ramsey family and their acquaintances. Through this, Wolfe is able to explore the complexity and ambiguity of people's mental lives and their relationships to one another. To the Lighthouse is also Wolfe's most autobiographical novel. Wolf's family would visit the coast in Cornwall where her father rented a cottage for them, until her mother died when Wolf was just 13. After this death, Wolf's father fell into depression, which is reflected in the character development of Mr. Ramsay in To the Lighthouse. Mrs. Ramsay is reflective of Wolf's own mother, both women die suddenly and too early. Part 2. Modernism one of the most immediate things when it comes to Wolf's writing, and to The Lighthouse in particular, is the writing style. And this is something that you're going to notice as soon as you open the book and start reading it. Wolf belongs to the movement of modernism, which has writers in it like James Joyce and Marcel Proust. One of the features of modernism, and especially with writers like Wolf and Joyce, is exploring the internal workings of people's mental lives, and the complexities and ambiguities of that. And this is very much reflected in the writing style that Wolf uses. There's no real dialogue in a traditional sense. All of the prose is set in the minds of the characters. Apparently, when Wolf was developing her writing style, she would spend hours just sitting and listening to her own thoughts and making notes on her thoughts and how she thinks and the way that her mind will get distracted or move from thought to thought over time. And that was how she developed her writing style. Now, To the Lighthouse is not a particularly long story. The edition of the book that I have is about 230 pages, but it does take a long time to read because of this writing style. Wolf sometimes shifts the perspective of the narrator between sentences, and sometimes it within the same sentence. And even when she focuses on just one person's thoughts, their thoughts are always changing to different topics really quickly, and so it's really hard to keep in touch with what's going on all the time, and you certainly have to go back and reread things just to work out what's going on. It's definitely a book that needs to be read slowly, but one great thing about this book is, because it's such a complex writing style, it's the kind of book that invites rereads, and you can just go back and back and always find something interesting there. Probably the most effective scene in the whole story for me is in the first part of the book when the Ramsey family host a dinner party. This is also one of the longest chapters in the book as well. During this scene, Wolf jumps perspective between all the various guests at the dinner table, and you just get to explore the complexity of their thought as they're talking to each other, drinking, or just sitting back and taking in the party in a moment of quietness. Pretty much everyone at the dinner party feels very conflicted about what's going on. One minute they might be enjoying them themselves quite a lot, then they might be thinking about a person that's annoying them or that said something earlier in the day that they don't like, then they might just think about a bowl of fruit on the table for a bit, then they might think about philosophy or art or anything, and it just goes around and around in this big carousel of craziness. My favourite bit though within this is when Mrs Ramsay, who is the hostess of the dinner party, is sat back and she's surveying the dinner party and the guests, and she's looking at this bowl of fruit on the table, and she's really hoping that no one touches 
the fruit because she's recognised that it looks really pretty as it is. And then one of the guests takes some fruit and she suddenly gets really, really angry about them. But of course, no one is aware of this because it's all going on in her head. And I just love that scene because it perfectly captures how you can be at an event or a social occasion and your mental life could be really active. You could be really angry about what someone said or did, but you don't express it. And so you have this scene that's for everyone else, it looks like quite a nice evening, quite a nice time, but in your head, you're furious. And I think Wolf does a really good job of capturing this dichotomy between people's internal lives and what's going on externally. Another favorite scene of mine in the first part that does this is a scene between Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey. Just after the party, they're sitting in the living room and they're both reading in silence and they're thinking about each other and their marriage and the books that they're reading. And Wolf just jumps back and forth between their two thoughts and how conflicted they are about their relationship to each other and whether or not they can communicate with each other, their anxieties about each other, but also their more positive feelings towards each other as well. And again, it's just amazing that in terms of what's going on externally, these two characters are just sat there in a room reading nothing dramatic, nothing explosive, and yet within their minds they're going through all of these thoughts and these ideas and these emotions, and neither of them are communicating that to each other. They just think that they're reading their minding their own business. In fact, To The Lighthouse has very little when it comes to external dramatic plot. There are a few moments, such as the character deaths in the book, that occur, but these are not presented in a dramatic way at all. The key drama in the story is all inside the characters' heads as they're working through their thoughts and their feelings towards each other, themselves, and the world. Part three, the intricacy of human beings and relationships. Another aspect of the novel that I think Wolf captures really well is the complexity and ambiguity of people's relationships with each other. Most of the characters in the story are just constantly conflicted about how they feel towards everyone. And this really does reflect how we feel often in real life. It's rare that you come across someone that you just like all the time or you dislike all the time. And Wolf captures this really well. We've already looked a little bit about Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey here when they have that scene together. So I want to look at two different characters who are outside of the Ramley family. These are Lily Briscoe, an aspiring painter, and Charles Tanley, a young philosopher pupil of Mr. Ramsey's who comes from a working class background. Early on in the story, they have a very important scene together where Charles is watching Lily paint and he says snidely, women can't paint, women can't write. And this is something that Lily obviously doesn't react well to. And it's something that she comes back to time and time again. It's a line that she never can quite get out of her head. And she certainly resents Charles for it. Now, I think in lesser hands, Charles would come across as just your typical patriarchal male who hates women and, you know, craps on female achievements. But Wolf makes things a little bit more complex than this. As the story progresses and we get into Charles's perspective on reality, we see that he is actually someone who's incredibly intellectually insecure. He comes from a working class background and he's got this teacher, Mr. Ramsey, who's a great academic, and he feels incredibly insecure about his background and he feels like people are always judging him. And so we understand then when Charles says women can't paint, women can't write, he's not saying it necessarily because he believes it, he's saying it because he recognises that women, because of their social standing, are going to feel just as insecure as him, and so he takes out that insecurity on Lily and says something demeaning to her. And this is actually something that Lily, at one point, I think it's in the dinner scene, she recognises this about Charles. She sees that he's insecure and she understands why he acts in that way. She still dislikes him, but she's able to see the complexity in his personality and his background. This is pretty much true of all the characters in the story. Viewed from one perspective, they can come across as incredibly mean or nasty or boorish, or on the other side of that, they can come across as kind of stupid and nicey-nicey and pleasant. But then when you get it from a different perspective, their whole personality seems to change. And Wolf just does a fantastic job of doing this constantly through the novel, so that everyone comes across as incredibly multifaceted. A great example of this is Mrs. Ramsey. To many people, she comes across as a very kind, matronly woman, a kind of angel in the house archetype, if you like, and people don't particularly see her as very intelligent. And this makes sense because externally, she doesn't show off her intelligence very often. But when we get into Mrs. Ramsey's mind, she does often think about big issues. Yes, certainly sometimes she thinks about her family and things that are related to her immediate experience, but she also has grander thoughts than this. And so we see that Mrs. Ramsey has a much broader intellectual life 
than other people sometimes give her credit for. And now contrast this with Mr. Ramsey, who to some people, like his son, he comes across as this big, bold, strong man who, you know, doesn't take any bollocks. But then we get into Mr. Ramsey's mind and we realise that actually we have a very intellectually insecure person who's ageing. Mr. Ramsey is very concerned with his status as a philosopher going forward. He's worried that after he dies, no one will care about the work that he's done. And so actually, he has this very insecure mental life inside of him that a lot of people externally don't notice. This is very similar to Charles Tansley. Both of these two men have deep insecurities about their social position, and that causes them to be quite boorish to other people. And so this is something that I think is excellent about To The Lighthouse, and what makes it worth reading. Every character is just so complex and dynamic, and there's so much there to learn about them as people. Whereas in a lot of books, you obviously tend to get a more static view of personality, where the personality is built around a few set traits, and while the character might develop through the story, it's all very linear and structured. Whereas into The Lighthouse, people are a lot more dynamic and fluid in their identities and how they change throughout the story. Again, it does make it hard to read because the stability of the characters is somewhat all over the place, but it does make it very interesting and very engaging. Part 4. The Death of the Angel of the House and the Rise of the Modern Woman So I want to talk about one of the things that I noticed about The Lighthouse when I first read it, and noticed it even more the second time that I read it. And this is to do with the general arc of the story, or one of the key themes that I see coming out of the story. It seems to me that one of the big themes of To The Lighthouse is the changing social status of women, and this is reflected in two of the female lead characters, Mrs. Ramsey and Lily Briscoe. Part one of To The Lighthouse, although it does flip between character to character, really does centre on the matriarch of the Ramsey family, Mrs. Ramsey. And then in part two, we get the section called Time Passes, which takes a more objective look at time as it goes on, and in this time period, Mrs. Ramsey dies. Then in part three, we focus much more on Lily's character, as she's trying to puzzle out a problem in one of her paintings, and the very end of the story has Lily finally fix this problem. Now, Mrs. Ramsey represents a very old-fashioned kind of woman. She represents what was called in Victorian times, the angel of the house. Now this is, as I said, a Victorian ideal of what a woman should be. Essentially, the angel of the house is a woman who is expected to be self-sacrificing to her family. She's meant to care for her family, give up things like economic opportunities or opportunities for education. Instead, her role is to submit to the family, to care for the family, and to tend to them. Her role is essentially to keep the hearth burning at home, both literally and metaphorically. Now I see Mrs. Ramsey's death, which occurs during the First World War in the timeline of the story, as essentially being the symbolic death of this kind of woman. It's the end of this matriarchal figure whose sole role exists inside the home. And then in the third part of the story, we see the rise of a new kind of woman, which is embodied through Lily Briscoe. Lily's central storyline is that she gives up the traditional role of a woman. She rejects marriage, and instead she decides that she wants to be a painter. And in the third part of the novel, she spends a lot of time thinking about whether this was the right thing for her to have done. Whether it was right that she gave up marriage to just do what she wants for herself, which is paint. And ultimately she concludes that that is the right thing for her to do. Ultimately she concludes that her art is worth it. Even if no one sees it, or no one cares about it, it matters to her, and she's doing it for her and no one else. And this is the ultimate rejection of the angel of the house. Because the angel of the house is someone who is self-sacrificing. They don't do things for themselves, they do everything for the family. And that's what Mrs. Ramsey did. But Lily is the exact opposite of that. Instead, she's rejecting this self-sacrificing ideal of woman, and she's making her art because she wants to. She's doing something for herself, and she doesn't care what other people think. And this is what I mean when I say that we have the rise of a more modern kind of woman. A kind of woman who does things for herself, who has her own autonomy and her own agency. Part 5. Time Passes So I've talked a lot about parts 1 and 3 of the story, which use the psychological techniques where we're focusing on the internal workings of the human mind, but there's also an additional part of To The Lighthouse which takes a very different style and a very different structure, and this is in part 2, which is called Time Passes. 
In this part, which takes us from 1910, which is where part one was set, and 1920, where part two was set, we watch as the Ramsey house on the Isle of Skye begins to crumble as the family don't visit it in those intervening war years. Partly because of the war, but also I imagine partly because Mrs. Ramsey will die in this interval, and there's probably a lot of family sadness about coming back to the house now that she is gone. And Mrs. Ramsey isn't the only loss that the Ramsey family suffer. The eldest son, Andrew, dies in the war, and one of the daughters, Prue, dies in childbirth along with her child. Now, all of these deaths are communicated to the reader without any kind of fanfare. I think in the case of Mrs. Ramsey, and probably in other cases as well, the deaths are given to in parentheses, almost like they're stage directions, rather than, you know, communicating to you this big dramatic death. I think Mrs. Ramsey's death is the one that hits the most. It's a really harrowing description that Wolf gives of Mr. Ramsey waking up and outstretching his arms one morning, and Mrs. Ramsey not being there because she's gone. It's really quick and brutal and so effective without any kind of drama or fanfare. And I think part of the reason for the lack of fanfare is that Wolf is trying to take the objective perspective of time, and time just moves. It doesn't care about different events. They're all just the same thing to time, right? And so you just have this really objective time moving slowly. But obviously as a reader, as a human being who interprets things and puts meaning onto things, you still give a lot of significance to these events. And ultimately it becomes really sad to see this house, which in the first part was full of laughter and enjoyment and family happiness, slowly wasting away into nothing. Meanwhile, the Ramsey family itself is suffering all these losses. And so metaphorically, I guess, it's almost like the crumbling house is symbolic of the crumbling family that's no longer close because it's fragmented, with members of the family dead and the ones that are living incredibly depressed. I think part two might even be my favourite part of the whole book, just for how out there it was and how much it shocked me when I first read the book. I was expecting it all to just take this kind of psychological approach, which was fantastic, and so when you get to that second part and it's a complete 180 in terms of what's going on, it was just fantastic. And again, Wolf has a wonderful writing style that's always engaging and always very interesting. Part 6, Conclusion. To the Lighthouse is an excellent book, and I think a very good introduction into modernist writing. I certainly found it easier to get than Mrs. Dalloway, and I think that that wasn't just because I read Mrs. Dalloway when I was a lot younger. Also, from what I know about Wolfe's work, it's one of her most accessible books, and it's certainly more accessible than more complex modernist novels like Ulysses, which is not only much longer, but impenetrable in places. That's not to say that To the Lighthouse isn't complex, because it certainly is, but it's just a nicely accessible book. And I also think that you don't need to worry too much about understanding every single line in the story. At the end of the day, Wolf's aim is to capture how people think, and sometimes we have thoughts that go by too quickly, or that we don't have time to assess, and so you should kind of approach the book like that. Just let the words wash over you, enjoy it, because you can always come back and read it again and again, and then you'll find new things to enjoy and to fixate on when you do reread it. I certainly found that that was the case for me. Alright, that's it for this video. Let me know down in the comments what you thought of my discussion of To The Lighthouse. Have you read it? Do you enjoy it? And what do you think of Mrs. Dalloway, given that I mentioned that earlier? I haven't reread it, but I am somewhat tempted to go back and read it now that I do enjoy, or know that I enjoy, this book of Wolves at least. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like, and subscribe to my channel for updates for new videos. That's it for this video though, so take care everyone. Ta-ra!